Uh, how do these mathematicians do it? I mean, all these different constants, all the symbols and the values behind them, how can they fit all that into their heads? Well, the answer is, they don't. Because you don't need to memorize constants if you know what they mean. Okay, so in the last Intuition Behind Blank video, I've explained the Euler's formula, and it was all fine and good if not for one glaring problem. I've just dropped the e to the x in there and didn't bother to explain how it could be its own derivative, so we're going to write this wrong right away in this video, and that's why we'll start with the long-awaited Euler's constant. Gamma. Oh yeah, gamma, that, that's the character used for Euler's uh, constant. The, the E constant is called the Euler's number. So that's not the Euler's constant, hey, hence why we're gonna, we're gonna start with uh, this. So um, what does this constant mean? Well, here you can see equation defining it. So we can start, first of all, by flipping the log because what monster puts negative on the left and separating it into two parts. First of all, the harmonic series and second, the natural log. Okay, so what's up with the harmonic series? Well, the series is simple enough. If you just imagine a block of size 1, then that's the series at n1, the length of this block. As we increase the n, we also add another block, this time one half the size of the previous block. And then we add the third one, one third the size of the first block, then the fourth, one fourth, and we just keep going, keep adding them until we reach a desired n. Now we can create another line next to it, this time representing the logarithm. And now we just scale them both. Sum up to 1 divided by 1 and natural log of 1. Sum up to 1 divided by 2 and natural log of 2. Sum up to 1 divided by 3 and natural log of 3 and so on and so forth. You can see that the sum is always ahead, so we can just take the difference between them. This purple line is there to represent the difference, and you can see that as we increase both of them, the size of the purple line changes. Now, as we extend these lines to infinity, the difference between them is the Euler's constant. But there is a problem. As neat as this animation might have been, and as accurate as this difference in lines is, I haven't actually explain the constant. I've only visualized it. That's because even though you now know how to calculate the constant, you still don't know what it means, what it's there to represent. And that will be the key point of the video. Not only what these constants are equal to, or where they come from, but what they mean. So let's start again, this time with 1 divided by x. 1 divided by x is a function which looks like this on a graph. You can see that for a 1, it's equal to 1. The higher the x, the smaller the number gets. The lower the x, the higher the number gets. Simple enough. Now let's ask the question of, what is the area under this function? Well, there are two ways you can approach this. The first one is we can approximate this area using rectangles. So a rectangle like this, a rectangle like this, a rectangle like this, a rectangle like this, and so on and so forth. Each of these rectangles starts at a certain value from our function and extends one unit of length. Now if we add together the area of all rectangles, we'll get the new area, or in other words, the sum of all of these areas. Now what is the sum of all of these areas? Well, it's height times width, that's the area of the rectangle. The height is equal to the function itself, so 1 divided by x, or rather k in this case, and the width is equal to 1. Always 1. So in other words, this is just a sum of 1 divided by k times 1. Or just 1 divided by k. This is the sum describing the approximation of the area, so the area outlined by the yellow rectangles, but there is another way. In mathematics, we have a tool that's integral for finding the area under the function. The squiggly, everyone's favorite anti-disintegrator. I've already explained how it works in another video, so I don't want to reinvent the wheel here, you can just go and watch that video. And then. Now if we take this anti-disintegrator of 1 divided by x, we get the natural log of x. Or in other words, this area is just equal to the natural log of x. But notice here that I said equal. Not approximate, not kind of like, not is proportional to, only equal. Except I'm guessing we're missing the magnitude lines, but that's not important. Meaning that even though our previous approximation was, well, just an approximation, this one is not. This one is perfect. 
I really want you to understand that fact, and what this effectively means is that we've got two different ways of approximating the area under 1 divided by x, basically two ways of doing it, the discrete and the continuous. So now that we know that, we could ask another question, just how far off was our previous guess? Well, if we start with a single rectangle, then its area is equal to 1. The logarithm up to that point, however, would be equal to 0 0.69314. That kind of technically is more like a limit, but it's close enough. We can see that the difference between them is roughly equal to 0 0.3. Then for the difference between two rectangles and the logarithm, it would be 1 plus 1 half minus the log, meaning around 0 0.4. Difference between three rectangles and the logarithm gives us around 0 0.44, difference between four rectangles and the logarithm gives us around 0 0.47, and so on, so forth. You can see that as we increase the amount of rectangles, the number also gets greater. So a question might arise. What would be the difference between these two as we increase our amount of rectangles to infinity? Well, let's think about what that would mean notation-wise. It would be the sum of the area of rectangles minus the natural log of the same amount of rectangles, and the amount of rectangles we actually care about is going off to infinity. Or in other words, our constant. Except mathematicians just had to freaking flip the log around to make it more confusing, because why not? It would've been too simple, it was minus on the right. No, we just had to flick the log, okay? Because the point I'm trying to make here is that this constant is equal to this equation. But the meaning behind the equation is what actually matters, not the numbers of the calculation. And in this case, the meaning basically boils down to the error of our approximation which then can be carried over into other things, and that's what understanding constants is all about. And honestly, I could go down, you know, this rabbit hole, but explaining where all of this is useful uh, is kind of a long story. And this entire chapter is only here as a joke, because, you know, I just... It's funny, because oil is constant, when everyone thinks it's oil is number. And, and so, uh, fine, I guess we'll do the oil is number next. We'll do the non-clickbait thing. Okay, so oilless number. Once again, we'll start with the sorcerer's runes, and only then we'll move on to, you know, the actually reasonable stuff. So oilless number is defined like this. Limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 divided by n to the nth power. Okay, uh, so why is that? Well, in order to answer that, we'll first have to ask the question of what is exponentiation? That's simple, just like repeated multiplication. So, you know, x squared is x times x, x cubed is x times x times x, x hypercubed is x times x times x times x, and x to the fifth power means you really need to move on and find someone better, okay? You deserve someone better. Quit going back to them. You, you're too good. Now, putting that aside, exponentiations have this one really fun quality of theirs, and that's the fact that their fixed point is 1. So basically, 1 to the first power is equal to 1 to the second, which is equal to 1 to the third, and so on and so forth. It keeps going no matter what power you bring it to. However, if you add just 0 0.0000000 bunch of zeros, 1 to R1, then you can reach everything. So on the number line, this is what you can reach by exponentiating 1, but exponents of 1.0000000000000000000001 look like this. So yeah, this is basically really similar to multiplication, except for multiplication, if you multiply a 0 by something, you get back to 0. With exponents, it's a 1. Now, the power of a non-1 number, you can get pretty much anywhere. And if you skyrocket to infinity, you will reach infinity. So this is kind of like the exponential version of zero times infinity. The problem with zero times infinity is that it's undefined. And you can think about it this way. You're multiplying nothing by omnithing. So that's kind of like any positive number could theoretically solve this equation. And that's the actual problem there. It's not really that we don't have any solutions. It's that we have too many solutions to zero times infinity. For the limit, however, this is kind of like the same thing, except for exponentials. And right here, basically what we're saying is that we want a number that's as close to 1 as possible. So basically, 1 divided by infinity, that's a 0. So 1 plus 1 divided by infinity would be just 1. But we're not dividing by infinity, we're dividing by n, and n is approaching infinity. So this is really more like 
as close as possible to a 1. But then we're exponentiating it once again to a number that's approaching infinity. Basically, you can imagine like a tug of war between the zero that's trying to reset the number and the exponent that's trying to blow it up. And the result is E. You can think of it as the exponents constant. So like the operation of exponentiation boiled down into a number. And I think that's the best way to represent it would be with the derivative. Was the derivative of an exponential? Well, depends on what you're exponentiating, to be honest. Right here you can see a table of a bunch of different exponents. Now you can see that it's always just itself multiplied by a constant, but these constants are odd. Well, to say odd is an understatement because they're not even integers, they are irrational. But beside that, you can see that they start lower than 1 and then they go above 1. So between 2.5 and 3, there should be some number for which it would be equal to 1. And that number is e. Why? Well, it's because e to the e x is its own derivative. It doesn't need to be multiplied by a constant. And so, here's how you should think of e. Let's say that you like to represent exponential growth. Okay? You just have something that's growing exponentially, but you don't know how. You, so we don't know if it's uh, 2 to the x, or 7 to the x, or 1736 to the x, right? You just don't know. All you know is that it's exponential. How should you represent that growth? Well, any number will do, they're all equally valid, but e will be the most convenient, because it makes things easier. It is the number of exponents. How could it make things easier? Well, I mean, I keep saying how it's exponent number and so on, but could we have an example, please? Well, don't worry, I will give you an example, just at the end of the video, because it requires just a fair bit more build-up, and we'll just need two more constants for this to make sense, okay? Next we have... Pi time! Pi time? What is pi? Well, this one's actually kind of backwards. For all the previous constants, I started with the use in math, and then went over the meaning. But since this is the only constant in all of maths that wasn't made by Euler, this one actually is better explained with the intuition right away. And so to explain it, we'll have to start with a square. An old classic of mine when it comes to explaining pi. Basically, what is the area of this square? Well, that's simple. Take the length of the side and multiply it by itself. Or square it, that's where the name comes from. Okay, but what if we take just half of one side? What then? Well, then, if we just take one half, that will make a square that's only one fourth of the original square size. So we need to multiply it by four. So basically, we have two equations which can describe the area of this square a squared and 4r squared. We'll focus on the 4r squared because I'm actually an omnipotent being from the future and the ways of fate have no effect on me. So now let's modify this equation by removing the corners. Graphical corner removal is simple enough, but how would that change our equation? Well, 4 would get a bit smaller. Then we can remove more corners. And more. And more. And more, and eventually we'll reach a circle. But what would we multiply our equation by when we reach that circle? Well, that would be the one, the only, pi. So what is pi used for? Circles! That's what it's used for, it's used for circles. Whenever you see a pi in the wild, that's why it's there. Circumference with a pi? That's the circumference of a circle. This random integral equal to pi? Top half of the circle. Pi in waves? How could there be pi in waves? Well, that's because waves are a circle. There is always a circle, and so this is where pi comes from. If we're going around a square, we can see that right here we've gone one half around the square, three quarters, and full way. When we go around the circle, you can do the same thing, one half, three quarters, and full way. So we can describe the way we go around each of them in relation to themselves, but not in relation to the other one. Why? Well, it's because in order to transition from one to another, you need to switch the constants. Wait, constants, not constant. That's because even though a circle has a pi, the square also has a constant. And that's because there is one last constant remaining, and that is the one. Now you might be saying something along the lines of, make it, how could one be constant? It's nothing like the other ones, but the truth is, it's just a real number. Just like 
any other real number. In that way, it qualifies as a constant, but where would this kind of constant be used? A simple example would be unit vector. So if you imagine a ball with some velocity, you can describe the velocity with just a vector. But this kind of vector can get really confusing. So what we really often do instead is we describe the direction of our velocity with the unit vector and the magnitude with speed. Now, in order to get the original velocity from these two, we just multiply them and there. But this only equals if our vector has a length of one. If it was any longer or any shorter, we'd have to scale it back. And here's where we get to the core of what constants are. For the velocity, we can use any number, but if we use a one, we don't have to rescale. For exponentials, we can use any number, but if we use e, we don't have to scale back the derivative by natural log. For rotation in circles, we can use any number, but pi gives us the full rotation instead of an almost full, and so on, so forth. These are all numbers that have something really convenient for the situation. One for units, that's why meters per second and not three meters per six seconds. E for exponentials, that's why it's e to the x and e to the i pi, not three to the x and six to the i pi. Pi for rotations, that's why it's a perfect half rotation, not almost perfect half rotation. That is the intuition behind math constants. Well, that was certainly a video, huh? I'm glad I promised I would be making one video every 10 days, only to then just still make one video a week. I'm hoping you've enjoyed this video, uh, and this is the thank you segment for everyone. And first of all, I would like to especially thank my patrons for helping me stay alive. Uh, recently, I've also launched a patron-only Minecraft server, in case anyone would like to join in. So, yeah, I thank you everyone so much to my patrons because... I would be way below minimum wage without you. I would especially like to thank Acronymous, Bull Lightning, Lake Bear, and Quasa for supporting me with the highest possible tier. Thank you all so much, although you already know I'm thankful. Uh, <laughs> then also there is the art. Thank you, returning champion All Matter for this. Just, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. I really wish I looked that cool in real life. It's absolutely incredible. And also I would really like to thank Timon, for these lovely, lovely make-its, with this one being my favorite, based on a true story. I have a Discord server, in case you'd like to join in and chat, and I stream every single day, so use live streams called Charity Checkouts, which is streaming for charity, right now we're streaming for charity, Prevent Cancer Foundation, would really recommend. Yes, these are all real thumbnails from actual live streams that actually happened. I'm gonna go now, I have more videos to finish, a chemistry video, quantum mechanics videos, and an open source video, so many. So for now, I suppose that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye.